So greetings everyone once again and welcome to the 101st session, session number 101 of the online Optom learning series OLS. And once again, today we have a privilege to hear from uh, Professor Glenn Steed. Uh, he has been with us for the first session where he talked about autism. And uh, Professor Glenn Steen is a pediatric professor at the Southern College of Optometry. He is also the past chair of the American Optometric Ed Association Foundation IC Committee and also the past president of the College of Optometrists in Vision Development and the Optometric Extension Program Foundation. He has a vast experience in uh, pediatric and he lectures extensively throughout the US and also internationally in the areas of vision development and the care in the infant and young vision. And today Prof is going to share with us uh, some tips, some tricks on how to perform retinoscopy, how can we do it differently and how can retinoscopy be a very useful tool in examining our patients. Uh, thank you, Prof, once again for, you know, taking up this uh, session very early uh, Saturday morning for you in the U.S., about 7 a.m. there. But thank you so much for giving us uh, your time, Prof. Um, you're very welcome. Um, 7 a.m., that's the, about the time I leave for work anyway. So uh, it, it's, um, it's just uh, a normal day for me. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I thank you for the privilege of being with you this morning and uh, hope that things that I have to say will be meaningful for you as you see your patients and hopefully begin to look at retinoscopy in a, a, a different way. Um, I want us to think of, of the process of vision as originating in your gut. And, and what I'm going to be looking, I call this just look retinoscopy. And what we're going to be assessing is how is the patient looking out at you? And if they are looking out at you, think of it um, uh, um, the, as, as a motor looking response rather than just simply a refraction thing. So it, it, we, we basically, I want to set refraction aside for a minute and, and look at it in a totally different way. And that whenever we look at development uh, through the process of using a retinoscope, uh, I found this quote very helpful. Success doesn't come from what you do occasionally. It comes from what you do consistently. So uh, look at, at development in that. And it, it think of that from the patient's point of view. What they do and how successful they are doesn't come from what they do every once in a while. It comes from the way they do it consistently. And the way they look out consistently into their world uh, can be assessed using a retinoscope. And we can directly observe development in their patterns of, if you think of looking and attending and focusing and identifying and engaging, each of those being more intense in terms of, of uh, engaging with that person, task, target, whatever. Just from a baby looking you in the eye to a child working a, a, a sophisticated math problem. These are the toys I use, and you'll see um, there's my retinoscope, the near point cards. I have one here with me, uh, targets for little ones. Um, I do, this is plus two and minus two flippers. I do assess accommodative facility. And these are my glasses that you'll see. Um, I use a double D uh, seg uh, for the simple reason, and I don't have those with me here at home, but for the simple reason that if I want to look like this, I've already influenced the, the, the refraction or the, the finding that's coming back. So I can now hold my head down, look through the top, and assess that without putting myself in an abnormal posture. Um, the toys there, the near point target, uh, targets for smaller kids. And these uh, lenses that I have, plus one in the front, plus 50 in the, uh, I'm sorry, yes, plus 50 in the center, and minus one in the back. So you can go by combining these two, a plus 150 to a plus one to a plus 50, obviously nothing, combining these two now to a minus 50 and then a minus one. So you've got plus one, plus 50, minus one in half diopter steps from plus 150 to minus one. 
And so it, it, it's very helpful rather than trying to, to do that. And I, I don't, I rarely use the phoropter anymore uh, with, with kids in terms of determining how I'm going to prescribe. I don't start with it like that because you can't get younger kids to sit behind the phoropter and um, uh, it, it, it takes away periphery. I also want you to think if you use a schiascopy bar, you're, you've got maybe plus two in front of one side and Plano on the other side where they're looking. If they're fragile or vulnerable in terms of binocularity, then you're going to disrupt binocular function there. And that's going to alter what findings you get. So I always start working from a binocular standpoint, not from a monocular standpoint. And um, uh, uh, I get that from this. Babies grasp the world first with their eyes and then with their hands. Vision is therefore a prime constituent in the development of the whole of the total child. Um, I did a fellowship uh, for a year at the Gazelle Institute of Child Development here in the U.S. Uh, did not, uh, Dr. Gazelle had already passed away, but he was a pediatrician who recognized the importance of the way babies look. And if you grasp the world first with your eyes and then your hands, uh, it vision is becomes the instigator and the leader in everything, uh, the development of the child. So therefore, with a retinoscope, we're observing that individual's effort, that child's effort to look out into the world, to connect with that outside world. Uh, Dr. Beth Ballinger had a quote that I love. We're assessing how they own their world, how they really have gone about constructing their world. And you can watch a developmental process as it is unfolding. Um, observing with a retinoscope can provide information about the choices the child has made and the patterns they've developed in determining how to look and engage. So you see, I've not said anything to this point and, and we'll say very little about the process of refraction. Uh, we'll get into that in just a minute, why it's different and may be different um, uh, between distance and near. But I wanna know how they look and how they engage. <clears throat> and as you work with that, and you gain proficiency in, in making those observations and subtle differences, the manner in which they've gone about the process of development becomes much clearer. And, and I will have a video in just a second that will show some of those additional things that, that, that we'll do. Actually, this is a video here. Now, I want you to watch this. And, and the, the, um, the task here was uh, we were shooting um, with our camera uh, through the retinoscope. And the patient is here, and we're taking a target and moving it towards the patient. We were trying, Dr. Paul Harris talks about stress point retinoscopy. We were trying to find the stress point um, and to see if we can capture that on video. Well, we weren't able to do that, but I think we captured some things that were much, much more um, um, important in terms of learning retinoscopy than just uh, a single aspect of it. So if you watch here. Open, open real wide now. Target is moving forward. Now, you saw it as a target was moving forward, you began to see the pupil constrict. And, and so you know they're accommodating as that, that uh, target is moving towards them. Uh, one of the things I'm seeing today is many kids showing large pupils from working on their devices. Uh, it's a persistent sympathetic response, but it's also defocus. If you're playing games and, and you're going to be attacked from one side or the other side, you can't focus on your target there in the middle. You've got to, to defocus and, and work out here. Well, when that's persistent after they finish the game and when they're sitting there in the chair and I move a target forward like that and I don't get the pupil constricting, I already know that I've got a real accommodative issue. And I will many times just take the retinoscope, hand it to the parent and say, oh, look at that, mom. You see how big that pupil is? Yes. And then I have them turn and, and look at my student. And of course, my students all have typical pupils. They, they, they're small. And, and I say, now, 
this pupil pointing to the child, this pupil is good for games and videos. And this pupil is good for show, with pointing to the student. This pupil is good for study and an academic. It's your choice. Which one do you want? Now, with a bald head and gray hair, I, I can make some of those statements that some of you younger students might not be able to make just yet, <clears throat> but get confidence in understanding what's going on with this child. And now you predict how the child is operating in their daily world. Uh, it's very easy for me to say, oh, you love your tablet or your phone, don't you? And the answer is, a, is, is almost 100% yes. And the parent in the background says, oh, yeah. But when I see that pupil coming down like that, I know we've got a good accommodative response. Uh, where, whereas if it's not coming down, I know that response is not good. And they, this child then is not prepared to go into a classroom and do things uh, the, the way that's expected of them. So now we'll watch. We'll continue this video. Okay, I was I mean, that was my pen. So we'll get it. We'll get a couple of cycles here. This is really hard. Yeah. We got to set it up on a table. Uh -huh. And it's back okay. at the plane of the retina scope. Now look at the target, sweetheart. Now you see the big change there, and and if you remember back at the very beginning. Um, I don't expect you to have been paying attention, but I gave no instructions. I just simply started moving the target forward. But at this point in time, what I said, my specific instruction was, now look at the target, sweetheart. So she is responding in a different way. So, so this is really hard. Yeah. We got to set it up on a table. Uh -huh. And it's back okay. at the plane of the retina scope. Now look at the target, sweetheart. There we go. Now, any time during the course that I say, whenever you get an explosion of brightness, that's what I'm talking about. That's the, that was a, just a brightness from just a different way of looking. But that's a more typical engaged response than, than the one prior to that. So remember those changes as we go along today. So I'm looking at just this overall configuration. I'm using a spot retinoscope. And what, what I'm doing then is sending in a round beam of light. And if I'm sending in a round beam of light, I want to look at how that reflection is coming back to me. And are they equal? Now, what's the brightness like? What's the color like? What's the, what all's engaged there? How stable is it? A child who cannot show you a, a, a stable reflex when they're looking at a target, and, and here is my target, and, and I hold it just like this. If, if they're looking for letters and, and, and they cannot hold accommodation stable, I can recognize that uh, very easily and, and then begin to predict apparent what's going on. I call some of those modulations and, and, and uh, any of those changes like that, but it's just a stability. How stable is it when you say, look at the letters? And by the way, on my card, how do I know they're looking? I know where the letters are because this is a keyboard with a few key letters missing. The F is missing. So if I say find the F and they point, I know they weren't really looking at the F. So I want to know where, where they're looking, how they're looking, what's the quality of looking. And if I say, uh, well, there's no F on there, and now I get that increase in brightness when they start looking for the G, then I know we've got potential there, but it's not there all the time. How do they change from one instruction to the other? Find the A, find the B. Do they really let accommodation go or do they stay with me? And if, if, you, if you just think about it, a child in the second grade or grade two, let's say they're reading and they're going to have to sustain throughout that. If the, this child finds an A and then releases into with motion and I give them instruction, find a B, and then they come back, how do you think that that's going to, to be applied in a classroom? Look at a word, back. Look at a word, back. They're going to be calling words rather than reading. So they may be intelligent, but they aren't able to read. They're just calling words. And then lastly, what kind of motion? Motion is one of the last things I, I use. And I use that more to see how tight, how, how restrictive is their ability to move in there.
And we'll talk about uh, all of those kinds of things. So as you see, it's not about assessment of refraction. It's about an assessment of how the infant and young child is going about the process of looking and engaging in the task that you give them. And my task is, is, is on, in one uh, in one hand, very simple. On the other hand, very complex. They have to search and find letters. They have to find the next letter. And then I want to know, is this a child that, that already has caught on to the game? And now they're, they're already looking for the next letter before they give you give the instruction. So we're looking at that overall process of development through the visual process. And it's not only a reflection of, of, of just how they have developed. Vision must become the leader and the instigator of action. Anything that's beyond what they can reach with their hands has to first occur, has to first, you have to first look through the vision process. You can't move and get out there and touch. You look out there and then you move and touch. So as I said, it's so simple, yet it's so very complicated and, and not complicated in a hard manner, just if you start looking, <coughs> pardon me, if you start looking, you'll see more and more and more every day. I've been doing this for 52 years now, and I see something more each day. Just in the last um, three or four years, I've noticed that, that kids are showing these larger pupils from, um, from using their tablets. It took me probably six months to, to nine months to begin to recognize I'm seeing kids with these large pupils. I would see maybe one or two a, some, a, a year um, um, and, and in, a, in a, a, a year where we saw a lot of them, it'd be one or two a semester. I'm seeing now five or six kids a day who are showing eight, nine, 10 millimeter pupils that, that rarely, they don't, they don't uh, respond fully to accommodation. And, and um, even though the kids might be able to read their letters, uh, they don't fully respond to that. So what I want to begin to communicate is the link that vision plays in overall development. And I have done a, um, a talk, uh, in fact, Vince, I did one yesterday for another group on the process of development. Vision must become, the process of vision must become the leader and the instigator. So don't ever, 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 whether you're a student, a practitioner, no matter your, your mode of practice or where you are, Never, never, never underestimate the value of the service you provide. You provide a valuable service and always recognize that. Um, just as the developing infant, therefore, you must learn to look before you see. Just look. Uh, Jerry Getman, one of my mentors, said an optometrist gets a palsy whenever they pick up a retinoscope and you go for these big movements. And what I want to do is almost hold the retinoscope still. And if anything, just really, really slight movements. I think I have a video that will, will show that in, in just a second. But really just look at those slight movements. Don't look at the big movements from motion along the side. That can come later. That's not the primary thing. It's the quality of how the patient is looking that's so important. And that may involve them learning to look and you learning to look in a different way. So just think of, of retinoscopy as recording a video and it's over time, an observation through time. And, and I'm not talking about a lengthy period of time. I'm talking about 20 seconds or so. If you take that first clip that we saw, it, it was only probably 10 seconds, five seconds for the first part of it and five seconds for the second part with a lot of stuff in between. So it, it doesn't take a long time to make those observations. You just have to make them and then just keep it as if you're doing a video in your head. Now, this is um, a patient. I want you to assess the accuracy of looking in touch just with simple looking. All right, Levi, touch that. Good. Now, again, touch it from straight up underneath. Good. Now, I want you to just look at that. No touching. And again, look at me. And now look at that again. No touching. 
good. And that's my grandson. I was taken at his house just for demonstration. And that was their puppy, that uh, their dog that, that came in right back behind them. But two things. Number one, we had a target. Did you, did you see, and I'll try to turn sideways, but his first response wasn't right up underneath. His first response was here. And so what do you think of accommodation and, and judging of where that is whenever he's coming at it like this? So that's why I gave him the, tar the, the, uh, 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 the, the command to come up right underneath it like that. But then when he's just simply looking at it, where is he looking? He, you can get him to point and he can touch, but is he focused beyond? Is he focused closer? How is he, is he focused with both eyes on there? Uh, the retinoscope gives you a good means of assessing where he is looking, how he is looking. Is he focused right on the target? Is he in front of the target? Is he behind the target? Where is he whenever he is looking at that target? Again, so simple, yet so complex. We shouldn't lose our ability to attend to any of those variations. They're not random. Kids don't just randomly, for the very first time in their life, at 10 years old, come up with a different way of looking. Uh, so those are things that have been practiced in a ma manner and a method that they've been practiced since very early in life. And so it's a, a, that's why it's so important to observe them over time. If you do an autorefractor for refraction, what does it do? It takes several different readings and then averages them. I don't want them to be average. I want to see those those um, uh, uh, variations and modulations have meaning. The the variations we see are actually observations, the overall process of development, and have specific meaning within development, and they're well beyond eras of refraction. Now, I'm not saying refraction is unimportant, but I'm saying this is a different test that we're using for which we're using a, a retinoscope. So watch what is going on and you can actually assess development. In, in a young child um, under, under three or four years of age, you're not gonna be able to put them in a phoropter and get a good uh, assessment of, of anything. Doing it out of a phoropter and with your retinoscope and just watching. That's why I call it just look, because I'd say, well, go, go look and see. Well, Students would come out and they say, well, what am I looking for? I, say, I would say, just look. Well, what, what am I supposed to see? The minute I tell you something to see, you're going to miss something else that's going on. Because that's what I would tell them. So I want you to go just look. Well, gradually over the course of a semester, they get to where they're asking to use my retinoscope. And, and they're making those observations. But they might not happen the first day or the second day or the third day. It's just doing it consistently over time. So there's this presentation of the retinoscopic reflex that I perceive to be ideal. And remember, I'm sending in a round beam of light. They might not show that consistent or uh, consistently show that ideal reflex. They may not show it at all. But my, my goal in doing this this is to see can I move them back towards the the optimum remember back to that first video clip the second piece where there was really an increase in brightness is the kind of thing I'm looking for not the more dull thing where I'm just playing your game I'm not really intently looking so uh, move it towards that now it, this this is maybe not quite as bright as I would like but again remember that and we'll pretend uh, that that this is that bright reflex that we saw so I'm sending circular light in if it comes back darker I know that the child is 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 really having to work to engage they're not there uh, as uh, they're not they don't have as much freedom as this first one does and now this one is really engaged or they have just said i'm i'm out of here i'm not playing your game but generally that is one who is trying so hard and the harder you try the darker it gets and then you get something that looks like that. Now, remember that if you use a streak retinoscope, you say, oh, well, that's just a streak. No, that's a round beam of light going in. And that's the reflection that comes back to me. 
So I know if, if, if this is with motion here and this is neutral, I know that's a minus axis 180. Uh, I still may even try a spherical lens because I want to know, is that part of the structure or is that something that shows up as they're beginning to, to try to um, uh, engage in that task? There's a minus axis 90 then that's just a little minus axis 90. Those are more ones that are going to respond. It, it's rare that you get something like this, but it, it's these are the ones that are going to, to respond. And then there's you got a minus uh, axis 180. And here you've got a kid who is just showing you this very bright central thing. So they're engaged, but they're really focusing. That's more typical of a hyperope. Um, that that uh, if, if you watch hyperopes as, as they walk into your room, and get in your chair or look at things. They're very central oriented and they don't see things in the periphery very much, whereas your myo begins to see that. Now I want to go back to this one. This is a, minor, a fairly high minus axis 180. Um, I was doing a seminar, uh, a live seminar um, a few years ago um, and with uh, um, an eight month old baby. And the baby was sitting in mom's lap, and he was showing me this pattern in both eyes. I held up my target, which was a, a finger puppet on a pin light, and he began to reach for it. And as he came up out of his relaxed posture in mom's lap and reached with both hands to grab that target, he went from this pattern to this pattern. Now, if I had been focused so much on trying to find the amount of astigmatism there, I would have missed this. How does a child go from this, possibly three diopters of astigmatism, to no astigmatism just by moving and balancing? But you understand that kids go through so many of those phases in the process of development. Now, had this child stayed in that pattern as I was as they were reaching and there was grabbing it and, and playing with it, then I'm going to manage them differently and probably start earlier with lenses than I am the child who does goes this way. And if that child goes here, I'm then going to manage them not with lenses, not with astigmatism lenses, but with a much, much more engagement in movement activities and reaching and feeling and touching and tummy time, reaching out beyond themselves. The motor movement causes that. So think about those kinds of things. And then is this a kid who is in a searching modulation? In other words, are there modulations more where they're looking around for things or are they in a refining modulation? And, and, and what I mean by that is the kid who is looking is not going to be as focused and he's going to be more aware out away from them. The kid who has now found their target and beginning to zero in, you'll see this particular kind of pattern. And, and, and you'll just begin, if you just watch over time, you can see where they are. Now, I understand some of these things you might say, that's just way over my head. Okay, if you start looking, though, you'll begin to see those patterns. But you have to start looking beyond refraction. <clears throat> those modulations occur in every aspect of development, including the process of vision. Remember, when a baby's born, what's their heart rate? Sometimes their heart rate's up to 110, 120 beats per minute. But what is it for a normal adult? 72 beats for, per minute. But what about somebody like me who used to be an athlete? My resting heart rate now as, as a, a 70 plus year old is 48 beats a minute. And so it's been that way my whole life. And so you, you just have to watch and see what kinds of things are there. Vision, the process of vision and the child and adult engagement in their world has the same kinds of modulations and variations, much greater in earlier in life 
and much more focused later in life. We'll deal with that in just a minute. So these modulations have meaning for me. Where are they and how are they doing? And are they consistent at all distances? Many times I will find my students find adopter uh, of astigmatism at, at far. And I come in and I do my near retinoscopy and it's just as nice and round. That tells me it's not part of the structure. It's not part of that eyeball uh, structure yet. It's forming, but it's not there. So those modulations have considerable meaning for me. And is this a modulation for refinement to focus in, which you'll see them begin to focus in and they'll get smaller and smaller? Or is it a where is it kind of modulation where they're looking? So I'm observing patterns as their very core of overall development. Uh, vision has to be the leader in overall development. Otherwise, think about driving a car. What, what if you had no vision? What if your vision was, was limited to what you could reach and touch? Vision has to be the leader and instigator in that. Uh, if they are still in a searching mode, which they should progress on to a refinement mode, process of vision may not be the leader, and it's an interference rather than a leader. If, if they're trying to read now, learn letters or read or do anything up close consistently, then, and, and they haven't learned that uh, means of focus yet, then that becomes an interference in their learning to read. So just think of refinement as developing focus and searching mode as trying to find where, you, where they are. If you just start with those two, then you'll begin to see differences and now you can begin to sort out those differences. So again, it's that video of all those things that go to make up what we call a refractive state. But take that video in your mind and it shows all kinds of things in the foundation of looking and seeing. But developing effective looking, both as the patient and you as the doctor, requires patience. Uh, I, I don't expect you to take the things, and I tell my students exactly this, I don't expect you to take the things I'm saying today and understand them totally tomorrow because you haven't looked yet. Until you start looking, you won't begin to understand. Then a year from now, you'll say, oh, that's what he was talking about because you'll see something that triggers back in your mind. That's what he said a year ago. That's the way I want you to understand this. You don't learn by listening and, and, and just reading a book. You learn by doing and doing that retinoscopy. We often rush to a conclusion with our impatience. Uh, that's why we go to autorefractors, boom, boom, and it's done. Uh, but that just gives you a small part of the story. I want to see the whole story of what's going on. So you, you, you limit that uh, whenever you do that. So how is the developing child reaching out into the world? That's reflected by how they are looking out into the world. Uh, Gazelle says a child reaches out with their eyes a good two months before they can reach out with their hand. Um, and he has a video of, of a four-month-old, and he places a one-inch cube there. And you can see that baby looking at the cube and their the, the hands are just almost wringing their hands. I want to get my hands there, but I can't get out to it yet. I'm not ready. But you can already see by watching with a retinoscope how they are looking out at that target. Are they fixed on it? Gives us information about the way they're selectively looking. Are they selectively looking at that cube? But only if we take the, the time to look. So the retinoscope is a tool to, to observe behavior and develop a treatment plan and use it to evaluate their responses for guidance and treatment development next steps. If they're a child who shows this cylinder band until they start reaching and it goes into spherical, then you can just watch that happening. Uh, you're going to manage the, you're going to develop your treatment plan much differently than you would if it stays there and no matter where they look, they show that particular pattern. So you do that differently. Compare that to just determine refraction by an auto factor and see you in a year. Uh, you need to follow these kids uh, that, that you go uh, away from just that uh, auto refractor and see you a year. You need to follow them more carefully and more closely. So watch them there. 
to a whole to, to many people the variabilities get in the way of that i'm talking about get in the way of reaching that final static refraction and that's why cycloplegia and fogging are used to control accommodation well uh, again those variabilities are indication of stages of vision development and and their potential to look and search and they get and they don't get in my way. They're important to me. I don't want to eliminate them. I want to see how they happen over time. So we should be assessing, observing a response to lenses and not simply utilization. We should not lose our ability to attend to those variations. They're not random. As I said, you're going to hear me say that. So it becomes important to observe them over time. They don't just randomly use that for the first time at eight years old. That's their, been their fallback way of looking at things throughout their whole life. So now that's a pattern. And how is they going about their business and how can I influence that are things that I want to know. Gazelle says the eyes are a top priority in the scheme of development. Uh, if eyes are a top priority, and remember, Gazelle was not an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. Gazelle was a pediatrician. And before that, he was a psychologist. So he's a psychologist, went to medical school, became a pediatrician. So he's coming at it from that point of view rather than the strict ophthalmology point of view uh, or, or optometry point of view where refraction is the important thing. So those modulations that we see have specific meaning within the concept of development and well beyond the areas uh, of, of refra areas of refraction. These modulations occur in every part of development. We talked about that. But depending on the magnitude and should they persist, intervention may be necessary. Um, if, if the child continues to show these large modulations when they should be developing that ability to focus in, then I've got to intervene in some way. And this pandemic has, has, has put kids and, uh, and adults and everybody in this state where they are on their device and for so long that 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 I'm seeing this persistent sympathetic response with these huge pupils. Um, I've, I've got a whole um, series on the the use of pupils and how um, I'm, I'm sorry, the the use of accommodation and in the processes of of how the the devices are engaged, how they engage in those devices leads to problems that we're seeing, but. Kids used to be on the devices maybe eight hours a day for, for social media and videos and things. Now you add another seven to eight hours a day for school at home. So now you've got, and they still are going to do their eight hours a day. So you've got kids maybe 16 hours a day on a device up close. 20 years ago, if you wanted to get something to eat, you had to leave your monitor and get up and go uh, into another room and get something to eat. Now, these kids are here. They just get up. They take it with them. And, and this, I call them a half generation. This is a half generation, uh, uh, um, not even 10-year-old kids yet, that have grown up in every part of their life. They've had a device. So I'm seeing these kind of things more and more. That's why Just Look becomes so important. Do they have large pupils? Do they focus? How well do they focus? Uh, are they showing these huge modulations that, that interfere if they want to focus and do things in school? Modulations have a meaning for me. So I'm observing patterns that are the very core of overall development of which vision is a leading part. And in my opinion, the leader in normal developing child. I've said that before, I've said it again, I'll say it again before we finish. Vision, the process of vision must become the leader in a typically developing child. Uh, I missed one. I'm trying to get away from saying normally developing. I'm saying, I'm saying typically developing uh, because there are kids who are showing atypical development, uh, um, neurodiverse uh, in, on the autism spectrum uh, that, that uh, may be normal just not in the way that fits our uh, society and the culture that, that we are in. Um, there's small variations shown by every infant and likely every patient that have meaning. Take a, a patient who's had a stroke, a brain injury, 
uh, something like that. They have to learn to use seeing all over again. They go back through many of these same processes of learning how to, to see it. And you'll see these same things with patients with head injury. Take a person, who, an adult, who is now in a new job, and, and they are more intent on their computer screen, more intent on the things they have to do. You're going to see these same processes as you go through. Um, uh, from Getman and Forrest and Norton and Smith over several decades, there's evidence suggesting that when these variations do occur, the patient is exploring differently and under different constraints, and it specifically changed when the exploration changes. And and I'll I'll I use uh, emetropis the process of emetropization as as uh, an example. We just accept that okay, that's what we were taught in school, and and that's what every kid goes through until they get to what their refraction is. And they typically start with minus axis 90, and then they move to minus axis 90, and then they move to minus axis 180, and then they move to spherical at near. All the while, they're, 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 they're spherical at distance and near. But we just accept that happens. Well, what Gedman found in 1950, which is 70 years ago now, <clears throat> he found first a scissors motion at near, and to me, that's the oh, I'm awake now. I haven't started looking yet. i got to find myself. Uh, there's a purpose to that. Then when he found the minus axis 90 at near in their development, they were playing cars or exploring this horizontal meridian. Now, what does that mean? If somebody is, let's just keep them spherical the whole time. If they're spherical and they're really, really starting to explore and focus, you'll see a spherical against motion all around. Well, if they're just exploring in one meridian, <coughs> pardon me, horizontally, if they're just exploring horizontally, doesn't it uh, make sense then that we might see an against motion here? And yes, they were playing with cars on a table or a high chair, all of it within arm's reach. When they went to 190 and 180, they were building towers and climbing. And if you'll start asking patients, as you see that change, young patients early, early in development, were six months of age, look and see whether they're showing axis 90 or axis 180, and then ask the parent, well, are they stacking things up or are they just still playing with cars? And I'll bet you if you see Axis 90, they're playing with cars. And as soon as they start stacking things on top of each other, blocks or, or, or thread, spools of thread or, or, or whatever, you'll begin to see them shift to Axis 180. And then they'll go spherical. And through these changes at near, they remain spherical. They're still showing 90 and 180 at near, but literally in their, their research, they would move out to an intermediate distance with the retinoscope and watch, and they were spherical, and then move out to distance, and they were spherical. And then they went through these same processes at intermediate and far. So sp remained spherical at near, went through the axis 90, axis 180, spherical at intermediate, and then the same thing at far. Those are things that we haven't considered and, and taken in consideration when we're talking about the, the process of emetropization. So it's not just something that happens there. It's a, a, a very focused part of development. And, and so remember, as we talk about the circle of understanding in just a few minutes, remember this discussion and, and where we are. So emetropization is a reflection of the developing child rather than a simple artifact. Um, it happens just as you are taught but there's more to it than just the way it happens. There's a purpose in those changes and, and they're connected throughout development. Even a scissors motion, you know, and, and I don't want you to say, well, scissors motion, that could be a development of keratoconus or other kinds of things. Yes, I know they're there, but a scissors motion in the process of development is when a child is just waking up, it goes away for people with keratoconus and other kinds of things, uh, corneal abnormalities, the scissors motion doesn't go away. 
but it goes away as soon as the baby begins to attend. That's a process of awakening. And it's not spherical and it's focused just the first few minutes. They're, they're not looking yet and you, you see all that. So it's a process of initial inability to come to focus on the light patterns and the intensities. As soon as they wake up and get that and focus, scissors motion goes away. So it, what, what I want you to understand of that is not to look for scissors motion, but to understand there are all these changes that go on as the baby wakes up and begins to look at your at you your target or, or or whatever there are all these changes and they have meaning they have meaning so uh, here's what I, i'm talking about whenever uh, i talk about the the circle of understanding the babies whenever they are uh, um, in the process of development i call it the circle of understanding and it's it's if you just uh, link your fingers together like that and and make a circle in front of you uh, that's everything they can reach is within that circle of understanding. Now, I represent it in a two-dimensional form, but it's a three-dimensional form, above, behind, all around. But then beyond that, things they can't touch or reach, it's a caution zone, and, and sometimes they'll reach out and go for it, and sometimes they won't, but there's this big, vast unknown that they're not going out, out there. Um, uh, to consistently to see. Now, you say, well, I've got a baby that's, um, uh, that's two months old. Uh, I remember my granddaughter, and I'll use that as an example. There was up in the corner of the room, there was a stereo, small stereo speaker uh, that, that was connected to the stereo system, but it was dark and in con high contrast to the, to the, the wall. Well, they would walk in the room and she would find that and she would fixate and look on that and try to move her head and begin to move her eyes. Babies look and find things at all distances, but they're much more comfortable with these things they can reach inside and touch inside their hands. Now, through the process of development, this area of comfort goes well beyond themselves. That caution zone becomes smaller. And the unknown becomes even smaller. Think of a child in development. First, you just get them up on their tummy and they begin to look around and then they begin to reach for things and then they begin to move for things out beyond there. And this, this whole area of, of, um, of uh, comfort expands. And they, even though they might not be able to touch it, they can look out and know and determine what they want to, to, to um, engage with beyond themselves. There's still an unknown out there, but now we've got a child who is crawling, and now we've got a child who gets up and they start walking and running, and there's this caution zone that some of them won't go to. And then you've got kids who are very passive, and that just still that vast unknown. They're not willing to reach out, so they're very passive in their development. And then you've got this kid that, that um, un unlike the, the passive kid, they just go jump in there. I remember um, there were a group of us that used to get together and, and play guitars and sing just uh, for fun. And one, uh, uh, I had a neighbor who had two sons, an older son and a younger son. The older son was musically inclined and he would play the guitar and he would sing with us. The younger son had no interest in music, but fell left out. Um, but rather than passively sitting to the side, he would just jump in the middle of all of us and start turning somersaults. This, this was a kid that later then be, be, uh, was much more engaged in sports much more engaged in movement activities and he was not afraid to go out into this vast unknown whereas many kids with passive development are very reluctant and hesitant to get out there now i said i'm going to talk about the circle of understanding this area i call the circle of understanding what do they know and understand <clears throat> And if you take your retinoscope and you're right at the edge of that circle of understanding, judge optics by movement rather than with lenses. So if you come inside that circle of understanding, very likely what you'll see is a good, nice, neutral, full reflex. As soon as you come outside of there, you'll see many babies who will just explode into a bunch of with motion. 
Well, let's see see what happens. What would you normally expect as you're moving the retina scope? And it's a lin. If you assume it's a linear process, you would expect them to continue showing with motion on inside there. But these kids don't. They show a well defined area in there where where the reflex is good, it's bright, it's it stays circular, and they've engaged because they've touched everything with their hands. As soon as you cross that into that area of unknown, and it doesn't happen that dramatically with every baby, <clears throat> but you may see a child who explodes, like I said, into a plus four, and you go on out here and they're plus four, plus six. Well, if you only treat them as how they see at distance and not look at how well they're defined here, then you might prescribe a plus four or plus six. But what I prefer to do is say, let's see if we can begin to expand that circle of understanding. And if we can expand that circle of understanding, then they're still now going to show a nice reflex in here. And that that shows in there, but now it also shows the differences here outside. Now, remember when we were talking about the the um, um, the, the emetrophization process? They're showing those the axis ninety, axis one hundred and eighty, and spherical here, but they're all spherical inside here. And now we go and expand on out to distance. And what we we're seeing here now is all nice and spherical inside. So we've got this whole area that's pretty much consistently the same. And, and so think about that, judging uh, your, your retinoscopy uh, by the, how you move, because you're changing dioptrics as you move. So watch what they are doing as you go through that. So as they go through that process of development, all these patterns are fragmented and they're variable, and they are working to help them stabilize. But they, if this is them, they are going constantly back and forth across this developing showing these huge variations. And, and I would estimate sometimes you'll get from plus six to minus eight a variation, depending on whether they're mad, whether they really intently want to get something, or whether they're happy and they're feeling good. So they'll show those uh, responses in the retinoscopy at, uh, that, that are consistent with their uh, emotions at the time. Um, they become defined for as they go through their, I mean, as they start, they're fragment and variable, but this performance and function become stable or they're defined form patterns. They're pa become, you, you begin to notice their, their patterns of behavior rather than just uh, this variability. And that includes growth and development. So as they grow and develop, I expect to see these patterns become more stable and, and more put together in the way they're doing it. So now you're getting movements like this. As an adult, you have depth of understanding, but you don't have as much. How many times have you, you uh, those of you who might have babies or, or, or watched babies, they'll find the smallest little thing on the floor that every adult in the room missed. So they can jump all, all along here, but we miss it because we're so much more focused in an area that is um, in our depth of understanding, our depth of focus is in, increased at that. So these defined patterns, uh, they're, they're habits, they become habits. And what do we then call those habits? We call those habits later diagnoses. So depending on how they move from this fragmented and variable variability and become more stable these habit these become habits and then diagnoses as we're going through so just look right now is the observation of those definable form patterns or forming patterns if they're if it's a definable pattern it's more stable you, you have fewer options, but if it's just forming, you've got a lot more options to, to do. And what do I mean by forming? It's not consistently there. Just like the baby with three diopters of cylinder, that when they reached it went spherical. It's, that's a forming pattern, not a pattern of, uh, that, that's there and defined at this point. So you want to watch them. So you can observe, they can be fragmented, variable, or they can be stable. 
and the modulations are present as long as they're in the process of learning. They need to learn to focus and, and be involved in that. But the key is whether they're consistent with the expectation. A three-year-old, uh, maybe I say that, a three-year-old showing you two diopters of, of variability and modulation is, is acceptable. A six-year-old who now has to sit down at a desk all day long in the classroom and focus and maintain their focus, even if they look up, they have to focus at a particular distance. They can't afford to have those two diopters of area of modulation. If you see those two diopters of modulation in a, in a six-year-old, then, <clears throat> then you've got a child who is in trouble. Watch the modulations, not just the refraction, because the refraction doesn't necessarily calm and stabilize the modulations. It just pushes it further out or further in. So this concept of just look is so simple. Just look what's going on. Yet it's so very complicated, and it requires an understanding of the overall process of the development and the link of process of vision. I, I keep saying this over and over because I want you to understand you are actually watching the process of development unfold in, in a developing child as you see them. And this process of vision is so critical in terms of getting a child up from uh, from just being on their tummy and not being able to get up on hands and knees and move to being able to go sit down in your practice in your office and do the things that are necessary so when when we prescribe on infants and young children that has an effect on their lifetime so if, if you start treating them like an adult in this six month age or this one year age you're you're having a different uh you're having an impact on them throughout their life the cultural re relevance says six months old have a different expectation than a 20 year old so don't treat them like the 20 year old get them to looking teach them to look what can you do to calm and stabilize that reflex when we don't prescribe though that also lasts a lifetime many of the the, the american um, um, uh, um, Academy of Ophthalmology has guidelines. American Optometric Association has guidelines that are both very similar. And the ranges for a six-month-old are somewhere between plus five, uh, plus five and plus six being inside that is normal. You have to go beyond that to be abnormal. And then minus four to minus eight. Academy of Ophthalmology says minus four. American Academy Academy of, of uh, American uh, Metric Association says minus eight. R regardless, there's this huge range, and and if 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 we look at that being supposedly normal at a six month old to a twelve month old or typical, and now the child falls outside of that, and what what bothers me is so many practitioners. If you see a plus five seventy five, you say, well, that's in the normal range. That you're fine. But if you see a plus six and a quarter, only a half diopter difference, then we feel obligated to prescribe the whole amount. Why not just prescribe an amount that brings them back into that normal range? Becomes very important. Now, I'm not suggesting at six and a plus six and a quarter you prescribe plus fifty. Uh, I'm, but I'm, I am saying, don't feel obligated if they're a quarter diopter outside of that what range that would be normal to feel like you have to prescribe the whole amount. Also, don't feel obligated that if they're plus 575 and within that normal range that you don't prescribe anything because you look at those variations and what can you do to stabilize that. I'll give you an example. I had a patient uh, last week that was an accommodative esotrope. Uh, he was four years old. Um, so he was a plus four at distance. And, and last year they had prescribed a plus four with a two ad. And he was essentially straight at both distance and near through that. Well, I was doing my near retinoscopy 
in in out of Foropter and just putting lenses. And I started with a plus five. I want to see, can I decrease the power? What happens if I just still go with the plus four, but what happens if I reduce the add? Well, with the plus fives, he was still showing me the esotropia. I put in the plus six, he came straight, but I'm still seeing with motion. So what happens now when I go to plus seven? Well, he goes then from being straight at plus six into a constant high, large angle, alternating exotrope at four at, at plus seven. So you would think that adding more plus would make the the accommodative esotropia, the esotropia part of it, more stable. But it doesn't. It takes it to where he's now an exotrope. So he, his his uh, uh, accommodative process is so fragile and he is so vulnerable to small changes that you have to be very careful in making that change go to where you see the alignment it's okay to look and see what happened what happens to the plus seven but this is one i i, I haven't seen one of these in a long time uh, that go into the exotropia you know that's always possible but when they go into the exotropia you know you've got a fragile and vulnerable uh, uh, accommodative and, and alignment process so if we prescribe that plus seven and, and many times many practitioners will just automatically give a plus three ad well if we'd given this child a plus four with a plus three ad assuming that's going to keep them straight now we put them into an exotropia that also lasts a lifetime and we still haven't addressed the fragility of binocularity at that near distance so when we over prescribe or under prescribe that lasts a la lifetime prescribe for what calms that reflex brings it more towards that round reflex that we were talking about and what they do when we prescribe and walk away, that lasts a lifetime. Whatever we do, I challenge my students 10 words. And that's my commitment to patients. And I want this to be your commitment to patients, their commitment. I will walk with you every step of the way. I'll see you as often as we need. I'll make the, the, the changes as we need to make them rather than just see you once a year. That doesn't mean I'm going to take you to your doctor's appointments if I seek a consultation outside of my office, but I'm going to go there. And let's talk about something. If you're in preschool, you've got this little um, 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 between A and B. It's pretty much a straight line. There are things you can do. But now you hit preschool, and all of a sudden B jumps up here. And it's a steep, steep, it's not even a curve. It's a steep change from being at home and, 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 being, and just playing games to sitting still and focusing and, and doing all the things that need to focus. And so it becomes, when you go to kindergarten, it sort of becomes like this. You know, we're, uh, I use this many times as an example. I say, look at the one and follow the line and tell me to which letter it goes. And people can usually do that. And then two, many times I'll say, look at the letter. But if it, depending on what happens right here, many times people will come back to the four. Well, you get from a number to a number rather than a number to a letter. And so uh, this is the kind of things they're, they face in kindergarten, not this particular example but it's an example because now they have to start making decisions does that skirt beside or does that literally cross and and making a decision here determines whether you're going to get here or back over here and and though that's very important in kindergarten so therefore and in, in preschool so the process of vision is an active process and therefore the process of looking is the first part of that. And then I, I keep making a statement like this over and over. Just look retinoscopy is the continuous observation over several seconds that creates a mental video of the changes in the reflexes. This allows you to determine if there are possible times in the reflex moves towards better rapport, better focus, better engagement, or away from rapport. Do they avoid that? And if they, if you ask them to look at something and they show you a bunch of with motion, they're not focusing in and developing better rapport with that target. 
rapport meaning uh, substitute the word engagement I, I use that word rapport and some people have said i don't understand what you mean moves towards better engagement with that target or away from engagement with that target and i'm going to try to remember to change that comment from rapport to engagement uh, as soon as we finish <clears throat> now I, I say make small movements this is the kind of small movement. I'm going to demonstrate the kind of movements that we normally were taught and, and we're, we're engaging with. And then you'll see how I make just really small movements. Now, what I want to show is the difference in movement and the difference in um, the, the, what I'm looking for in this. Many of you, when you do your retina scope, will do these big movements looking for huge shadows right at the edge of the pupil. I'm looking here with very, very small movements, looking to the light movement on the back of the eye, the movement of the light pattern on the back of the eye, rather than a shadow up here. So remember, small movements versus big movements. And there are times when I even move my retinoscope with smaller movements than that, almost still. So it's very important. So if you've got a child looking for letters on a near card, I have them find the A and we, you saw that. What kind of modulations are you seeing? And so here's the, the, the thing I use. And these are the targets that I use. These are for preschool, kindergarten, maybe first grade kids. Uh, but I add smaller letters in here uh, and these are all closer together for the older kids because I want to see, okay, find me a lowercase a, a small a, rather than a capital A. And, and I want to see if there's a difference in the way they look. So now I don't have to reach for lenses. I don't have to do other kinds of things. I just say, find the big A, now find the small a. And if I were seeing with motion here, the first thing I would do would be add lenses a small amount and then increase the lenses. Now I've gone now from a plus 50 to a plus one. Now I'm combining those to a plus 150. And what I'm looking for is where is the point I get a reversal? Let's assume that I've got two kids, one and both of them show plus 75 to start with it near. But one, as I add, go to the plus one, I'm getting against motion consistently. And, and, and the other one, I have to go to a plus 150 to get an against motion and a reversal. I've got more room with that kid that moves up to plus 150. I've got more room to prescribe and, and have them go in a spherical lens than the one who blurs out at plus one, because they may not be able to, the, the, the second patient, the one it blurs out, at, I'm, I'm sorry, not blurs out, the one goes into against motion at plus one, you're at the upper limit. And now you sit them down at a classroom desk, and I love spherical lenses. I prefer to go with spherical lenses first, because these kids are gonna be looking all over. Uh, but if you put those on and they look up and they can't see the chalkboard or the, the, the projector screen or whatever it is they have to look at across the room. What's going to happen? The first thing that's going to happen is glasses come off. And then after two or three days, glasses are in their desk. And after a week, nobody knows where the glasses are. And so you have those kids that then that your, your, my approach was good. They need to focus up close. But the long-term effect was not good because they're not and they're not only are now not able to wear them for distance, but now they're in the desk and they don't wear them for near. So that wasn't uh, a good thing. I have to go with a bifocal with that kid because I start my prescribing at near rather than far. But I want to make sure that the lenses I prescribe, they can see it far. Now, that hadn't been as much of an issue during the pandemic where they've had virtual school because everything is right here. You know, and the, and the, the, the real uh, problem is, is a kid's whole world now, their whole aspect of development is in a room. They're working on their device uh, for school. Then they're working on their device for videos, and they don't go outside. And, and if you look up uh, Nature Valley, I believe it is, 
Nature Valley three generation. Google that, and you'll see three generations of of uh, of a families, different families. And one of the the last kids says, "I binged watch four four uh, seasons worth of a certain particular thing in three days." Uh, you know, just an incredible amount of up close. Another one says. I've got everything I need. I don't even have to go outside. And so this is a generation of kids that's growing up and their whole world is here. So <clears throat> um, current methods of prescribing are based on, on an inadequate assumption that the distance correction is a starting point. So what you saw with, with me and, and the, the patient there, my grandson Levi, I started with no lenses. I always start with no lenses. Traditional near retinoscopy is done at near but distance refraction. The MEM uh, monocular estimate methods done at near but with distance refraction. All those are done with distance refraction as a starting point. I don't use distance refraction as a starting point. You're not going to find differences between distance and near if you use that distance as a starting point. Even stress retinoscopy, Bell and Book often start with no lenses, but that's not a requirement because they may do that. I start with no lenses, and one of the reasons I do that is I had a patient come in that was a bilateral pseudofake that had cataract surgery. She was nine years old, one at age uh, five, and another at, at the other eye at age seven. Um, she was wearing minus 17 in the right eye and plus three in the left eye. Now, with 20 diopters difference in prescription of right eye and left eye, what do you think her binocular function would be, even if that was correct? My student did an excellent job. He went on the right eye, plus five, minus five, plus 10, minus 10, got no improvement. It was basically uh, count fingers um, uh, here at um, um, less than 12 inches. I come in and I take the lenses off. And what I start getting is, hmm, I, in, interestingly, with the lenses off, I'm getting with motion in the right eye. That's almost equal to the with motion in the left eye. So then I start, and they can't look, they can't see there at near because they're pseudo fake. But then I start adding lens powers. And this, as I said, entered security on the right eye was hand motion and count fingers, maybe at, at about a foot away. And they had 2070 in this eye with the lenses. And so they were wearing a three at three doctor ad. I start adding power and at plus 550, I'm getting equal motion. Of, of just a very, very slight width motion, right eye and left eye. So they're equal. Now, had I started like tradition would have been done and my student did an excellent job, we would have assumed that plus, minus 17 was just, they just not going to be able to see any better than that and start that conversation with the parent. But when we take them off, guess what now? With the plus 350, we're getting 2070 in this eye. 2025 in this eye. So we've gone from 2050, 2070 in the left eye, just put another half diopter of plus to 2025. Start with no lenses in place. See where you are. Even if you've done a perfect distance refraction, take them out. Now look at them perfectly at near and see what you're doing. Again, think of that process as originating your gut and how they're looking out there. Adult usually is uh, more stability with fewer fluctuations and they've stabilized. But for the child, it's more an assessment of how they are developing that looking process, that focusing process in the early stages as all these patterns are developing. And then again, my, my statement is create a mental video of the changes you're seeing. Process of vision is an active process. It's not a... Um, a, a a passive process that you just put lenses in front of. Uh, so maybe we've been looking at it in our own static manner. So how do we look? If we start looking at earlier and earlier, we can watch that process of vision development, how it's used and what our measurements mean. And maybe even back to what we learned in the first year of optometry school. And that was big pupils mean 
defocus, small pupils need mean focus. Watch those things as you're doing them and, and, and going about that. What we see now with the infant to the preschooler is just an accumulation of various patterns of development. And we can determine how a child is, is developing and how they're initiating the vision looking process. And is it the beginning of developing appropriate visual patterns? Or are they developing substitute patterns as described by Steph Skeffington? Convergence insufficiency is a, is a substitute pattern. Uh, accommodative esotropia is a substitute pattern for, for accommodation. Um, astigmatism is a substitute pattern. When if all those things are substitute patterns and performances as they get older, could we have intervened? Or how are they developing the abilities of self-regulation in life? The child who does not show you good stability of focus here who is in school is not going to be able to show you that good stability in terms of self-regulation. They're going to be the impulsive child. Link those things to what you're seeing because this is just a reflection of how they are looking out into the world and how they are engaging in the world. So it becomes uh, apparent that, that the looking process of vision first originates inside of us as a motor process rather than light and image coming to our eyes as a sensory process. How I reach out is much more important than how do I passively sit and wait for information. If I don't look appropriately, I don't see appropriately. If I don't develop the ability to focus, the ability to, to, to focus where I come to neutral motion, the ability to focus consistently with the pupil coming down as I focus. If I don't see those kinds of things in a three-year-old, then they won't develop the ability to precisely see in terms of distance visual acuity. So you, that internal curiosity becomes the driver of how they look and how they engage in life. So the quality of patterns we develop in our looking guide our, engage, our actions and our engagement, whether it's us developing the process of just look or the child developing the process of looking out into the world. And here's a here's a, uh, a a patient that I want to show you, and and if you, if you have a lot of light on your room, you might want to darken the 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 light because I do have a video, but but the quality is not good. But again, it shows you something that's very very significant. CJ has a an exotropia at distance and near, a right exotropia. He's 2080 at far uh, in the right eye. 2020 in the left eye. There's no response on stereo testing and retinoscopy observations are this. So where is the child really looking and pointing and can he sustain? Uh, where did that go? Um, well, I did have a video of him, but I guess it's gone. So the retinoscopy observations were that <coughs> that he um, was looking there, but this left eye, which showed better acuity, was much brighter and much more engaged. The right eye was much darker. When I covered the left eye, you would expect them to come down, down and begin to focus, but he did not until I uncovered and then both pupils came down. What does that tell me about how that right eye is operating in terms of focusing? It's just sort of moving along and trying to catch up with the other eye, but it's just out of the picture, has not developed that ability to focus, and we want that to be able to show. And if that comes up later, so where is the child really looking or pointing as it, they then where are they looking with that right eye as they you see the pupils and focus come in when the left eye is is uncovered so now focus is taking place primarily with the right eye left eye is following along do both eyes look the same color motion color brightness pupil size the stigma what does it mean when asymmetries are present and they're not stable how accurate and consistent is the child's ability to focus on the task What's a child's ability to sustain on a, a, a task for an appropriate time? 
when you push up uh, or hold focus at a variable target. So if you push up, I expect to see the pupil size come down. I expect you to go into against motion if I'm moving it towards you. How stable is that? Um, what happens when you're going in and now they lose binocularity? You'll begin to see that one eye may drift off and both eyes will go into against motion where they were increasing in width motion. Just watch and see what happens. And, and, and don't make judgments from day one. Make judgments after you come in and you've watched this and you've seen things a couple of times and now you relate it to something you do in your other testing and you say, oh, I can use this and get a whole lot more information than spending time doing some of these other things. So what's that significance? Can the child accurately focus at near and release to far and return to near? We do facility. How do they make that change? Is it at the expected level of what you know they have to do in the every day in the classroom and what you can you do to make it easier and more efficient? Now I do have a video with that somewhere. Um, is this a patient that touches everything in the room from one thing to another without stopping to identify anything? Visually, what are they going to show? They're going to show fairly marked with motion. They don't really focus in. They have to touch. Did not focus on the target or attend to the target I was holding. No refining modulation. In other words, they're not really trying to focus in on the target I'm holding. This is a patient that, that's just very active and has never developed that ability to focus in. What happens when they ask them? Are the adjustments needed? How do these questions relate to how the child tries to connect in their everyday world? So if you see that child and they're just focusing like this again, they're going to use that same pattern throughout uh, their whole development process until you help them begin to rein in and see things. So you have this patient that's going here from infinity to near. And where's the point of focus of a two diopter myo? If this is infinity and this is the patient, it's somewhere around 50 centimeters there. Now, you take a minus two lens. Where does that image form? That image forms at a virtual image at 50 centimeters. So what we've done is we've taken infinity and matched that to the patient's in infinite infinity rather than We say, oh, well, we moved them out there and they seeming to be originating from. So if you over minus, you're just moving that target along here rather than moving them further out. But now let's take a target at um, 25 centimeters. And if you ask them to look at 25 centimeters, where are they looking? They're looking here. Now... And you put the image, the minus twos on, that's without the minus twos, because that's inside their far point, so they can look directly right there. Now you put the minus two lens on, and now they have to look at, at, at 16, three quarter, two centimeters, rather than 25 centimeters. So you're actually asking them to overcorrect and overlook and over accommodate just to look at that. Keep in mind, you're you're moving distance with lenses. You're not the axis. Are they looking? How can you match that? And if you match that with strict refraction, you're matching where their far point is with a lens that brings distance into here. We're not changing where and how the patient is looking. And if lenses move out into them out into the world and not the eyes, we're not correcting anything by matching their refraction. We're moving that point to where they focus the image. Ah, here's this young man. Now you you close your uh, or, or turn some of your lights off in the room, and you'll be able to see this better. But we're looking. Remember, this is a young guy who is an exotrope here, and he is um, um, fixating with this eye primarily. And we're able with the beam retinoscopic beam that we have throughout to, to, to periodically get a good look at both eyes. And what I want you to compare is the brightness 
I want you to compare the shape of the reflex because you'll see the shape changing in this eye and it's fairly consistently round here. So watch as you, uh, as we are uh, um, having the patient look at a particular target. Not quite. You see, there's a good, now you can begin to see that. You see how much darker that is? You can clearly see both are very bright. Now that one's getting darker because we're moving a little more towards the right. We're trying to get both together. Can't tell if I'm a little high or not. So I'm well over to the left eye now. Mm -hmm. And this eye is right eye always is relatively dark. Always down. darker. And you can see now that you saw a horizontal and pattern. Go to the right eye. I'm on it. No, not quite. There you go. Just keep looking right there. You see the difference. It's really bright. Still now watch really what bright. happens when I remove my hand. Incredibly bright. We had one of those white moments. Mm -hmm. oh, open real wide. Look at it. Now, I want and, and those changes you're seeing in there, that's what I call modulations. You're, you're just seeing a change in the brightness. You're seeing it all over just changes it's not stable uh it, it it's not there where it needs to be now watch what happens as soon as i move my hand remove my hand take this away and you keep looking when i take my hand away keep looking right in there ready and you see the pupil constrict both eyes do it again it's so hard for me to hold my left hand perfectly okay, steady keep looking keep your eye this this eye the, the pupil is larger now it's not focused in and watch it as soon as i so that eye is not focused at all. One of the things we want to do in terms of <clears throat> therapy and management um, is to get that I eye to away. moving um, and, 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 and focusing. So you see that modulation in the right eye. You see differences in configuration. You saw sometimes just a horizontal band, and then it would go spherical. Then you saw uh, um, stuff in the middle, the darkness patterns in the middle that's not consistently bright like the, the left eye was. Um, where was he focused? What, what's going to happen if you decide, well, I'm going to patch this, this child? What's going to happen in terms of what he can do? And, and if you're going to patch that child, be sure and do that for uh, bits and pieces at a time rather than, say, patch all day. Because he may or may not learn to focus with that eye. But he, you can see there. And this is a VEP that we did. You can see several things that are very interesting here. Um, this, this green pattern um, is, is OU on there. And the blue pattern is the left eye. So you come way up here in the VEP with the left eye, which is, that's a, a fairly typical response. But with the right eye and both eyes, we're down here. So that means on the VEP, what he's doing with the right eye is dragging down performance here with the with both eyes to, when both eyes together are used. Um, which is a pattern you certainly don't want to have. So just look at everything as it's happening. Watch it and then begin to piece it together when you add your other findings to that. And the more you piece that together, I'm seeing what I see in Just Look Retinoscopy consistent what I'm seeing in a VEP. I'm seeing Just Look Retinoscopy what I'm seeing in a FOIA. I'm seeing Just Look, what I'm seeing Just Look Retinoscopy is what I'm seeing on accommodative findings. When you start comparing those, you'll, you'll start getting more and more and more out of your Just Look Retinoscopy. So consider this continuum from exploration to fixation, the quality of fixation. Consider the stability of the reflex, consider the modulations and the changes, and through development, as they become more stable in their looking process, they'll show less power, less variability, and less power. If they don't develop that, then they're, going, they're not going to show less power and more control. They're going to still show a bunch of width and hyperopia. Uh, make sure it's not due to limitations of movement. Sometimes, you, when, you know, what happens whenever you've got your, your four plus four uh, child and he turns his eye to be able to see clear? What happens to the motion here? Goes neutral because now he can focus. This gives him the ability to focus. So 
make sure it's not due to that. Uh, too much power can limit the process of visual and overall development. Uh, remember the kid who went into the exotropia when he was overplus. Uh, I've seen probably four kids go into some characteristics of the autism spectrum when I would, would put too much lens power on them. And I've heard similar responses from um, uh, a colleague in Texas, a colleague in England, that they they were they call me because they were just uh, really disturbed because this kid, one of the kids, just started uh, the hand flapping and walking on their toes that had not been exhibited before when they put on a plus four. And I said, okay, what happens when we put on a plus two? Well, they put on a plus two. Kid did fine. Um, it, they began to show a pattern of control. Now, when I say the kid did fine, that doesn't mean they're fine, we'll see them in a year. That's one you have to follow very carefully. But when I say what I mean when I say they did fine, they began to look and stabilize and focus in a way that they had not before. Um, uh, the one in England, um, they went ahead and prescribed the, uh, the the power, and I didn't get the call until afterwards. But he started seeing having nightmares and seeing things, seeing monsters in his room. When we cut that back down, much of that behavior went away. So don't think you're just dealing with an eyeball. You're dealing with a person, and with just look retinoscopy, you can watch those changes happen. And our goal is to nurture development in infants and young children, just as we nurture and water plants and remove the noted barriers. Look beyond refraction to determine the child's readiness and determine any, uh, any barriers that might be in place or forming. If you begin to see an over accommodation, if you begin to see an axis 180 cylinder come in and you can put some spherical lenses on and it's, it's more, it becomes more spherical, you know that's not a stable part of the process. Look and see what happens. Don't be a barrier to the child in your chair. Just look. See what's going on. Take this different view of an understanding of what we might be seeing and how that might be. But again, don't expect, uh, if, if you've never used this before, much of what I say, I'm saying is overwhelming. But I don't want you to, to just be overwhelming and dismiss it. Just look. Just start taking a look. The more you do it, the more you will see. I've been doing it 52 years. I see something new or something different on a regular basis. I don't see it every day like I did early in my career, but I'm seeing it on a regular basis. And I'm beginning to see things even in kids who are, are on the spectrum those that might be able to respond and those that that might not, depending on the way they begin to focus in when I give them a target. It's, it's really just a determination of how they're looking out in the world. And isn't that what you want them to do throughout the process of development? Develop a more stable ability to look out in the world because that shapes them as a person. And if you just look for a few seconds, Doing and watching equals looking. You're doing and watching equals looking and how they're doing that. Determining if they're looking out too far, not looking far enough, confused, or where they're. How, how do you tell if they're not if they're looking too far out? There's a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, one one way is you'll see against motion. Uh, another way is is putting lenses in front and have them touch letters. And if you've overplussed this child, you might still see with motion, but they will really come in and, and press hard against your target. Whereas if you decrease that amount of plus, then they gently touch. Or if they stop short, you know you can be over minus or you can sometimes even be over plus. But, but your power is not right. Adjust the power and see what you can do, not by just watching motion by watching how they touch the card. How do they judge where that card is in, in space? And, and watch and see what they do with those kinds of things. Um, and you, you see many times, 
uh, what we would call hyperopia, myopia, stigmatism, scissors motion, anisometropia. If they're temporary and task-specific and not stable, that's what I want to see. I want my kids, when they hit a hard word, to even show me myopia. I want my kids to, when they're thinking about something, I want them to release into uh, what, what I would see visually as hyperopia. But they're thinking about things farther away. When you start thinking about things, you don't look closer here. You, you, you begin to look farther away and you're not focused on anything. And if you just watch a colleague, some of you students, watch each other as you read something here and then look away to think about it and watch the changes in motion you get there. That's all a part of the process of development. Stable findings, though, are not always good during development, and they often indicate a more permanent change in structure. They indicate that stabilization, that pattern of looking that's not good. So determine if they're in touch with their surroundings, their level of rapport with their engagement with their environment and surroundings, the level of equality and brightness, depth brightness and equality of reflex color. If that reflex color is, is uniform throughout, if they're equally bright, then you know they've got a system that is set up to do that. I remember a kid who was four months old and eventually we diagnosed him with uh, delayed visual, visual maturation. And I came in the room, he uh, did not acknowledge me, did not look at me. Uh, I used my retinoscope and I called it uh, just the uh, blah reflex. It was not active. It was not reactive to anything I did. And it would be some people had already uh, determined that the kid was blind because that's the way he operated. But I said to mom, okay, we can assume he is that, but let's also assume that, that he's not. We don't know at this point in time. <clears throat> So I know there's not a, an opacity that's doing that, 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 that's creating an issue. I did not see any, um, when we dilated, uh, I did not see any retinal pallor uh, indicating uh, atrophy of the optic nerve. So let's just try some things. Just turn a light on and off. Turn a light on and get the uh, aha reflex. Turn it off. You're not going to see much change there. And then turn it on and begin to get him to doing that. Mom was very, very engaged in this whole process and added a whole bunch of other things rather than turning the light on and off. Came back in in three months. I remember, he was four months old. Came back in in three months. At seven months old, I walked into the door. The first thing he did was look right up at me. And reflect the retinoscopic reflex was much, much brighter, much more engaging. So I'm later, uh, three months later, 10 months of age, walk in the door, he looks up at me and he smiles. We do stereo testing. He sees the pictures popping out at him. What would have happened at four months of age if we said, he's a blind child? You, you, you got to begin to engage. I would hate to have that child be four years old. And now let's look back and say, I should have done something when he was four months old, not waiting till four years of age to do some things. So determine the limits of where they're comfortable looking, engaging, move the retinoscope in and out, <clears throat> take your scope and, 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 and change optics change the value by moving in and out rather than putting lenses in front. Young children should be expected to show a full active reflex. As they began to explore, you see many of those changes take place and you know, changes in brightness, changes in color, quality. The harder they have to look, the darker it will be, but I want that to be temporary. More color might come in, but I want that to be temporary. You might even see a difference in the quality, but I want that to be temporary. All of those things temporarily I want you to see. But you always want to, them to return to that full spherical, bright, equal reflection until they're looking for the next exploratory task. Children with delays often show a focus point, but it's not as active as in normal development, not as bright, doesn't change as quickly, and in all direct responses to the task at hand. It just doesn't react. Even pupil sizes, pupils don't respond fully. They, they just haven't learned to focus. So watch all of those kinds of things. If there's difficulty in learning to developing the ability to look, 
that'll be shown the retinoscopic reflex as a continuing instability in the reflex. So they've got the instability, this instability, and now you've got to sit down and read something in grade one. You're not going to have the ability to do that. So you're going to be behind. Two diopters of fluctuation in a six-year-old is much more significant than two diopters of fluctuation in a three-year-old child. Six-year-old, I expect to see very little fluctuation. Two diopters of fluctuation on a three-year-old child, I'm not concerned. Showing with motion at near and two diopters of myopia at distance tells us something. What that means is if I'm showing a little with motion here, but now my refractive measurement is two diopters of myopia, Think about what that should be. If you reverse the, the, the you know, your students are learning about lag of accommodation. If you see somebody Plano at far, what do you expect it near? I expect to see about a plus 75, maybe a plus one, but a lag of, of accommodation when I scope it near. Well, what happens if they're showing you that plus 75, what should you expect at far? I would expect Plano to be my distance refraction. Well, now this kid's showing two diopters of myopia. I've exaggerated that a little bit. Usually it's only about one. But, but there's a mismatch now in how they perceive distance and how they perceive near. And, and we have to understand that that's a problem. You can't just go now with a distance refraction because then remember how we are moving distance we're, and, and we're requiring them now near to focus much, much closer than we did. So here's some observations. Patient number one, you got an eight-year-old who can't find letters on my keyboard target here. Well, here's a kid who is using uh, a keyboard all day long in school, and he can't look to find the letters on the keyboard target. We, we've got a problem there. Patient number two shows a variable focus, and it's not consistent. Now, you put those two kids in the classroom with the kid that easily knows where the A is and the B is and, the, and, and all of that on this keyboard target. And, or the kid who it now shows a stable response in looking. And these two kids are going to be compared to that one. They're going to have difficulty. Patient three, it's neutral to start, but it's dull. But as I go in and start adding lenses, I don't get a reversal in motion at near to plus two. This is a kid that's going to have more effort in accommodation. You put him again, all three of these kids now, again, in, in the same classroom with this kid who does everything the right way, the way the typical development, and they're all going to have trouble. You got slight against the start plus 75 moves to slight width. Hmm. They're over accommodating through nothing, but now you can get them to respond. Don't ho hold out that, that, okay, I've got against motion. I've got to use minus. Try some plus and see what happens. <clears throat> now you, here we talked about that one. The one that's showing with motion in the air and a minus 150 at far. You put all of these kids, any of these kids in the same classroom, with the kid who has typical development, and the all five patients are going to struggle. So now we're going to look at a combinative facility, which I talked about earlier. And what are we looking at? I'm taking a plus or minus two, and I don't have lenses in my flipper here, um, but um, I, I have a target. It's a it's a different target, and and I'm putting plus twos, minus two, plus two minus two in front of the patient and watching their response. And I want to watch the speed. I want to watch, do they, they fully accommodate? Do they fully make the change? And these are the targets that I use. Um, I use these targets. This is a 2025 size letter. And I have that uh, occasionally say, look in there. I have two things. So I'm going to say, how many rows do you see? And many times on the minus phase, they'll go to plopic and say, oh, now I see four rows. Whereas if I had one row, then they can guess and see those kind of, these are larger targets, 2080 size letters. And um, you use those many times when they are trying to, when, when they can't clear the smaller letters. But here's this is an accommodative target here, small letters, and I'm doing Plus two, watching him clear. Minus two, watching him clear. 
plus 2, minus 2, end. Now, you take the child who, what I would expect, you expect them to be neutral when they're looking at my target, and we're just assuming it's neutral. Now, when I put the minus 2s in front, I expect a with motion first, then I expect them to go back to neutral motion. Put the plus twos in front against against motion, and I expect them to go back into neutral motion. That's the typical, the anticipated response. But what about the kid who shows you when I put the minus two in front, goes only to about minus one. Maybe can or can't read the letters, but only goes to minus one. Now you put the plus twos in front, maybe goes to a plus, a one diopter of against motion, not uh, the full response. Again, you put that child in the same classroom, the one that easily clears, 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 and and um, watch them as they, they go. Now, I, I started doing this a few years ago. <clears throat> I said, to him, you learn something regularly. When a student came out and I said, Joey, we've got an accommodative problem here said, no. I said, well, go back and do a facility. So he went back in, and he did the facility just as a subjective response. And how many of you, if you've been doing facility at all, the kids will say, clear, 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 clear. They just get in a habit of saying clear, and they're saying clear when you don't even have lenses in front. He came out, he said, i got 25 cycles. So that was the very first time I ever took my retinoscope in. And like I said, it was about six years ago. Took my retinoscope in and I said, I want to watch this. And, and I could see there was heavy against motion with plus, heavy with motion with minus. And I said, you can't see those. Really make those clear. And what I found was four cycles in a minute. <clears throat> the average, if you do a full classroom of all kids, is, is about seven. I expect 12 cycles. But he had four. <clears throat> now, you put him in the same classroom as somebody who has 12. How are they going to operate? So what do you expect when they intentionally look? Can they make the moves? Can they, move, can they hold that when they make the move? Or do they look and make it clear and then let it go? And, and this, it, it's, it's very similar to this. Um, and, and Ken Frieda published this in Optometry in 2002. But this is a, a signal that's turned on, and it's a, four, um, 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 a, a, a letter, and it's at a four, diop, four and a half diopter a stimulus, and it's held for a certain length of time, and it goes off. We watch the response, and the response doesn't come up to the full four and a half until it's halfway through here. And now that it's turned off and it doesn't come back down to the starting point until significantly beyond. Now compare that to the kid who you turn it on, they immediately go up there, they hold it. Now you turn it off. There's always a little delay. They hold it and then come immediately back down to where they are. So it, it shows you if you have a number of flips of patient ref, uh, uh, that, that you expect to, to make it clear, but how much do you trust that subjectively? You can observe that objectively. Now, Chris Chase did another one. This was just a sustained looking ability and with a five diopter stimulus. And here the green one is a good response. This is a not so good response. But what about the child that starts out here and then you can see them decrease as they go. You can see that happening with the retinoscope also. So um, that, that's research versus the clinical evaluation. Just look. And that's best. Of it. I did a, um, um, a the COVD checklist, which is a, a parent checklist of, of how the the kids are doing. Anything over twenty is suspicious. So fifteen out of the 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 twenty six had over twenty five, and three out of the twenty six had over twenty. So eighteen out of the uh, twenty six had. Um, um, an atypical response when they did not clear plus and minus two. So 23 out of 26 would, oh, I'm sorry. This is the only three of them had under 20. Under Only three had under 20. So 15 and, and eight, which would be over uh, at like 89% when they did not pass the plus or minus two facility to stop there. 
So again, it's the continuous observation over several seconds that allows us to derive meaning when assessing this information. By assessing only the motion, you're limiting the performance that can consistently add to prescribing. And in our brief summary, use that more for refraction. Basic distance refraction and Fourier are not sufficient to assess full function and development. You just look retinoscopy for observation in the manner in which the process of vision is used to direct action. Begin with no lenses in place. Observe the responses and reactions to tasks. You give them a task, find a letter. What's their response to that? When you put lenses in front, what's their response to that? So use it, just look at how they are responding. Consider refractive compensation. So I'm not saying don't do refractive compensation, but when you have stable refractions of abnormal degree and they don't change when you're doing that, and it's consistent at all ages, you've got to prescribe something at distance. But even then, don't go for the maximum on these young kids as they're developing. I turn and ask a parent uh, or ask the child, is he driving a car? And I'm communicating more to the parent that we don't need these precise, sharp distance visual acuity things for this child who is eight years old and, and they're not getting in a car to driving. We can leave him a little undercorrected. When significant anisometropia, amotropia is present, that increases the risk for amblyopia. So you've got to prescribe in those kind of things. But you'll be surprised if you start with equal power lenses, how many times they begin to equalize uh, the um, anisometropia. So if they don't, if you don't alter it with that, then you got to go with that. So it should always be considering uh, underlying issues when there's a need to issue, uh, initiate a change in the manner in which a patient is looking. When you see the reflex calm and stabilize with the use of lenses, we prescribe. When you determine the patient needs support in near point activities and testing, they may have a calm reflex to start, but if they can't hold or sustain that over time, you just look for more than refraction. And that's the main thing that I want you to get out of this target. Um, prescribe for the process of development to help them there. Consider partial refractive conversation only. I think we've already done that. Um, I want to prescribe to increase the ability and direct action in looking, attending, focusing, identifying, and engaging. All of those things are important, and they should be led by vision. And so I want to do that. Each one provides a stronger foundation for the previous. So you're, you're looking at development. You're giving them a stronger foundation when you manage what they do. You can literally watch this child put themselves together as they go through the process of development. And that's so very important in everything they do. I want to thank you for your time and attention today. Um, I know we've gone a little bit over, um, but uh, I think so many of these things are important. Uh, that's my email address. Uh, feel free to email me uh, with, with questions. I may not be able to fully answer every question in an email because email doesn't always convey, but I'll do the very best I can. Um, the, the main thing is set aside refraction and just start looking. There's a wealth of information there that you can use. So thank you very much for your attention. Hey, thank you so much, Prof. I think uh, very comprehensive. And uh, I think from tomorrow when we go back to our clinics, we'll look at our retinoscopes probably differently than what we were uh, doing uh, as, of, as of today because we were only looking at retinoscopy just as a refractive tool rather than yes. anything else. Yes. And maybe some one step ahead would be to just examine the pupillary reaction, if at all we would look. But, uh, you know, looking at all these uh, reflexes, looking at the response and the feedback is what we now we need to uh, look Baby at. steps. Yes. Ba baby steps. Take one step at a time. Don't try to take everything in at one time. Baby steps. Yes. But, you know, in this, I've given you so many things to, to, to look for. Don't be overwhelmed by that. 
Excellent. Like you said, start with a pupil. Start with one thing at a time. Um, uh, the, the kids that we see in our clinic, we're inner city. They're, they have dark eyes and dark pupils. It's hard to tell many times just with a pin light where the Pekinji reflex is doing a, a Hirschberg. Couldn't mm -hmm. think of the word. But whenever you put the retinoscope behind there, you've, you've got essentially a pin light. Now you've got that background illuminated. You can tell precisely where those Purkinje images are in there. So it, just, just start adding those little things one at a time. And, mm -hmm. and you'll say, oh, I want to know more. I wonder what happens if I do this. That's right. That's the good thing. Okay, great. Just one question here because uh, probably we have patients with uh, you know ptosis and nystagmus. Any tips on you know looking at this? We are only concerning about the the just look technique. So okay. this is yeah. nystagmus. Yeah. Um, um, and let's start with ptosis. Um, one of the things th that you can do there is is if you can take your retinoscope and you can see the Purkinje image in both eyes, the, the reflection of your retinoscope light in both eyes uh, on point, then, then that's not interfering as much as the one that comes on down and, and you can't see the reflection. You know, and everybody understands what I'm talking about, the Purkinje image, the reflection of the light from the cornea. If you can see that, then I'm not as worried about it as I can the one that you can't see. And, and, and the one you can't see on one eye or even both eyes, or if they have to turn their head to, to, to alter their head posture to do that, um, then, then you need to, to um, um, take a look uh, at, at what you need to do uh, for instance, referral. Um, I had a colleague uh, that I worked with that that made a pair of glasses that that had a um, a wire back there that literally brought the lid up. Uh, you can do surgery for the ptosis, but the 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 retinoscopy gives you an idea of where they're looking. Nystagmus. Um, um, again, you're having them look at a target here. Where do you find null points? If you uh, move the target closer, do you find a null point? If you come on in here, do you find a null point? And that becomes a starting point for just giving them activities at that distance to do where the nystagmus is minimized. You're not necessarily going to make that uh, uh nystagmus go away okay yeah and uh, i mean you did mention about the mohindra and uh, the other near types of retinoscopy but how are they different just a quick uh, one if you would want to um, the the dynamic is done i do that in in full uh, no not full room illumination but good illumination mahindra is usually done uh, mm -hmm. with reduced illumination they're looking at a light and i'm having them engaged uh, in finding letters uh, i even have uh, uh, passages that i can read but I, I have them looking for letters. They're engaged in searching for things. Or if it's a baby, I have a, a, a pen light with a um, um, uh, finger puppet on top. I have them looking. And, uh, you know, babies are going to tear off the, the arms on those finger puppets or, or whatever. They're going to reach for them. They're going to go in the mouth. They go in the mouth and they go in the sink to be washed before the next patient comes in. But, but, I, I want to have them engaged. Dynamic is just that. They're engaged in doing something. Mahindra is more where are they looking when they're looking into a light. And, and that's translated into a distance retinoscopy uh, more than it, it's done at near, but it, it's, it's transposed into a distance retinoscopy. That's right. Yeah. And uh, the next question here is, would you be probably seeing the modulation in the patient is probably, you know, uh, on cycloplegia? Um, I don't think you can do that um, because w w the, the modulations I'm looking for are one in response to accommodation and you don't have, you don't do near findings or near testing with cycloplegic refraction. Now, let's, let's set that aside for just a minute. If, if you've got somebody that's trying to look 
and 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 they're under cycloplegia. You may see some of those kinds of things as they try to focus, uh, but it's, it's going to be different prior to you than it is what I'm looking for prior to using a cycloplegia. That's right, uh, and and I'm not saying you don't ever use any of these things. I'm not saying throw cycloplegia away, throw this. I'm I'm not saying that. I'm saying we're looking for a different kind of thing. And, and we're looking to see how the child and the, and the developing child is, is operating it near, which is where they are going into the classroom to do. That's right. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. And uh, one, one, one last question, probably uh, just to, for the interest, like, you know, when we are doing this, uh, just look retinoscopy, is there any way we can record it or we just record it what we see or is there any particular you know way of recording it for future references how do you recommend us to record that because we need to compare and we need to see at each visit right that uh, that that is the million dollar question <laughs> we have tried um, many times even the reflex is too br like like you know, cell phone. Um, cell phone is, is, is a great tool, but it's so good that it, the reflex coming back is too bright and you can barely see the modulations. What those early ones were, were captured through the retinoscope using a, um, um, a, a Canon a, a actual VCR type recording camera. Um, but you can't just have that in your in your office to to uh, record everything. Boy, if anybody, if any of you find a way to do that, please let me know. Because to me, the best teaching tool we can use is one. And and that the very first one I showed, where you got that increase in brightness, yes. that wasn't even what we were looking for. That was by accident. But that's the best. Uh, recording, video recording that we've been able to achieve. I wish there was a way to be able to do that, not necessarily in your practice, but just for teaching. Because whenever we, we look at those things and when we see those things, if we could record those, as you say, uh, that would be so much more beneficial. Because I didn't, the first time I looked at those recordings, I didn't eat all of them. I didn't see some of the things, the one where the, the exotrope, where we saw the pupils come down when I uncovered the eye. I didn't see that until about the third or fourth time. Or, I mean, it just didn't register with me until about the third or fourth time I watched it. What, what you're suggesting is there a way to do that becomes so valuable in teaching, in teaching, yeah. because I can talk about it yeah. all day long. <laughs> but if you see one of those like that, it, it has a different impact. That's right. So if, if you or any of your colleagues find a way to do that, please let me know. And, and, and I'll give you credit for it all, all the way. I, you know, the, we need it for teaching purposes. That's right. Yeah. So again, some homework for us if you are trying to, you know, start doing baby steps. Uh, as, as Prof mentioned, we can also look for how to make a record of it and see whether, you know, things can be uh, used in the future reference teaching is again very important but again for uh, you know monitoring the patient let's say what happens and you know if you yep. prescribe an adaptation of glasses what happens after one month so again that monitoring would be really uh, useful for us as clinicians absolutely absolutely okay prof i think we have taken all questions what uh, we had on the chat thank you so much once again uh, you know, for sharing this uh, new technique uh, with us. And I think we will definitely go and try out and see what we will learn from that, uh, you know, doing. Yeah, and don't, don't stake your career on doing just look retinoscopy at day one. That's right. Baby yeah. steps into it. And then you'll, the more you see, the more you'll say, ah, and you'll try something else. Ah, and you'll try something else. You develop as part of that process too. So you're very welcome. I, I enjoy working with you guys. So thank you. So thank much. you.
most welcome most welcome for please be reminded we also have a session tomorrow and it's a bit early i'll see you probably in less than 12 hours uh, we have a session tomorrow and this is related to dry eye and uh, contact lenses how to help patients with uh, discomfort with contact lenses so thank you everyone for attending yes prof anything yeah. and i will say andrew is is very very bright young man thank you so I've, much i've heard him two or three times lecture and he's a very bright young man yes so again uh, please do attend the session if you are interested in contact lenses and you know if you want uh, to get some tips on how to treat your patients do attend the session so thank you prof thank you so much uh, once again Uh, have a good day ahead and to the attendees take care be safe and i will see you again tomorrow bye bye all right bye 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 prof thank you bye bye